Welcome to Grace Life Church Podcast. If you would like any more information about us, please visit our website, gracelife.com.au. What I love about the book of Mark is that Mark actually refers Jesus as God the servant, rabbi or teacher, whereas Matthew and Luke tend to refer him to God to God as Lord. And if you actually read the book of Mark and you could hear it through each preacher over the last few weeks, that Mark highlights the authority Jesus had. And Mark also, he gives us a, a, um, an insight to the miracles and personal interaction that Jesus had with us. So important to say relevant. The Gospel of Mark also betrays Jesus as constantly on the move, right? He's always on the move. And it's that forward motion in Mark's writing that keeps us always looking, you know, always he's reminding us, look to the cross, look to the cross. You know, there's not much time left, not much time left. He uses the word immediately 38 times in the Bible because Mark is redirecting our thoughts onto the cross and the resurrection. So today I actually want to speak on, uh, we're going to speak on chapter 7. And this, just going to give you an overview of chapter 7, explores Jesus' relationships with both fellow Jews and Gentiles, right? So we know that, I know Pastor Scott's speaking about the Pharisees this morning, but we know that Jesus came up with a lot of religious attitudes, right? Who can relate? <laughs> And the Jews believed that salvation was reserved for Israel and they were dependent on their devotion to the law. Whereas Jesus reveals that salvation is the matter of the heart. Again, the heart. And is available to every single person of every nation. So one way Mark illustrates this truth is by really getting us to understand Jesus in the way of how he went away out of his comfort zone with his disciples and he went into a Gentile region where he showed compassion. Firstly, we see that, that he showed compassion to a Gentile woman in chapter 7, verse 24. You can read that in your own time. Powerful passage. But today, and I was praying and I've been really just saying, God, what do you want to say? And I actually want today, we're going to look at a man who could not hear or could not talk. I want to talk about the man that Jesus healed and gave him the ability to hear and the ability to talk. Amen? How about we open up our words this morning? Let's go to Mark 7, verse 31. When you have it, just say amen. Let's go. For the ones who's got electronics. <laughs> okay, verse 31. Again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to put his hand on him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, if afar, I've been practicing that, that is, be open. <laughs> Immediately his ears were open and the impediment of his tongue was loosed and he spoke plainly. Then he commanded them, that they should tell no one. But the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has, he has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Amen. Sure. Such a powerful passage. Interesting. This story is only recorded by Mark. It wasn't recorded by the other 
gospel writers. Just love the way that God works, you know. He would have been told, hey, Mark, you need to add that story because there's a reason behind it. So Mark wanted to highlight to his Gentile readers that Jesus cared for and cared for them and, them, and he wanted to minister to them. And he, Mark also wanted to also talk, you know, it's also the lead up to the cross and resurrection. So Mark highlighted Jesus as the restorer and Christ's power to overcome this. And also this story serves as a prophecy, a promise, and a picture of the restoration that Jesus Christ bore and continues to bring to this broken world. So as we study this passage, let's remain today to be open. Just open your ears and your hearts to what the Spirit is saying to us this morning. Amen. Holy. Thank you, Lord. We just pray right now that you help us just to center our thoughts. We just thank you that you, our ears are open and our hearts are open to you. Speak to us, Lord. We pray, Lord, as I, Lord Father, decrease, you increase. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. We thank you that you are taking us on a journey. Thank you for your renewal. Thank you for your restoration. Thank you for your healing. We just want to thank you, Lord Father. We just want to submit our thoughts. We, Father, we just pray against distractions. We pray that our mind doesn't wander, but we thank you that we can just be centered on your word this morning. Speak to us, Lord. Prepare us, Lord. And thank you, Lord, for the new season that is to come in your name. Amen. All right. So I've got a map. So when we look at this map on journey of the map that Jesus took to get to this particular man, it was a massive detour that Jesus takes. Oh, my gosh. He blows up the GPS, like, on this journey. The journey that actually they said it could take up to six to eight months to take. Oh, my gosh. I struggle to get to, from my home to the city sometimes on my GPS. I'm fighting with this voice all the way. No, no, I don't want to turn left, right. Oh my goodness. I mean, I have respect for Jesus. He didn't even have a road map or GPS in those days. But I just love what JR said, like be led by the Spirit. So Jesus goes from Tyre to the north through Sidon, then to the south and the west, going deeper into Greek Gentile territory, then back east to the Sea of Galilee. Huh. That's what I love about Jesus. The journey is all about, it's all for us. It's for you and for me. So Jesus made his way back to the Sea of Galilee, but this time he went into the region of Decapolis. So this city is actually referred to the 10-city group on the eastern border of the Roman Empire. So Jesus was actually going to the city to do some preaching and teaching that wasn't his intention he wasn't being open to go well here I am <laughs> if you actually refer back to Mark chapter 5 where we read about the demon possessed man and you can read that in your own time but I'm just going to summarize it for you Mark chapter 5 tells us that after Jesus healed him he went away and began to tell Decapolis what Jesus has done for him so when Jesus arrived in the city people already heard about his healing touch, and while he was there, they brought along this deaf and mute man. So there was, a, so they already knew, they already knew. So when Jesus entered into the city, they were like, "Oh my gosh, Jesus is here! Did you hear what he did for that man?" I mean, Jesus told this person, this demon possessed man, "Don't tell anyone." But honestly, you know, <laughs> when something has changed your life and transformed your life, you get excited about it, amen? You just want to shout it from the rooftops that Jesus has saved me, Jesus has healed me, Jesus has set me free. Can someone relate, right? Amen? When you first got saved, you were excited that you were no longer lost, but you were found. So Jesus enters in with no intention, but they already there was already like the crowd was humming and it was like, you know, I'm not even going to refer to footy. But then there was a man whose need would be met when Jesus came to the city. 
who today needs a need met in your life? Oh, one person. Thanks, Nadia. <laughs> Fantastic. Everyone is full of needs. Right? <laughs> All right, so I want to talk about the need in Mark 7, verse 32. In, thir- in verse 32, we are told that this man is deaf and has a speech problem, impediment in the Bible. So they heard Jesus could heal him. So they said, come on, let's go. Jesus is in town. I'm sure they would have done some sign language. Come on, let's go. We're going to bring you. And they brought this man to Jesus. What I love about Jesus is his ability to care and connect with people. Let's keep it real. That's what Jesus is about. Care and connect. See, I believe Jesus showed him concern for the dignity of this man. Jesus set him apart from the crowd to show he has a place with him. So can you imagine this people bring this man to Jesus and all of a sudden this man is like going, what's going on? But I just want to take a few minutes to unpack the way that Jesus ministered to this man. I just love it. So the first thing when I read this is I noticed that Jesus took him aside. He took him aside. See, sometimes we can get caught up in the crowd and thinking we have to please men or women. We have to do all this and we like we have to please the crowd. But you know what I love about Jesus is that he took him away from the crowd regardless of their expectation for them to see and witness the healing. But I loved that Jesus is a gentleman, so is the Holy Spirit. He doesn't embarrass the man who already, as I said, would have felt embarrassed coming out into public with his condition. This man is deaf and he had probably no idea. Can you imagine when we, that's why altar calls are very private Because imagine stepping out in faith, knowing that you have something that you want to ask God to help you with, and you can feel anxiety and fear. That's a private moment that you want to have between you and God. And I just love the way that Jesus did that. He took him aside. See, the deaf will also tell you that their affliction makes them a special class of people. Now, I'm not ranking disabilities right now. What I'm saying is I'm talking about the blind. The blindness and most other physical handicaps can be seen by others, right? And those who see the handicap make special allowance for the handicapped person. But you can't see that a person is deaf sometimes. They can go through life and get on a bus and they can go into a shop. And and then when it comes to communication, that's when you notice something isn't right. So it's not obvious And often people will grow impatient with a deaf person because they had trouble understanding something. Sometimes people treat the deaf like they're less intelligent than others just because they cannot hear. And I think that goes with every disability and any limitation. So Jesus, and I love him, Jesus is not a show person. He's not a show man. Jesus refuses to make a show of this man. Jesus takes him aside and does a great job work in his life who needs some work in your life (laughs) constantly (laughs) so by taking this man aside Jesus is saying you are more than a you are more than a problem you're an individual and you're important to me and I care for you That just brings me down to earth when I read that passage because sometimes you can get caught up in busyness and sometimes you can treat people as a number or just a thing. But when I read that passage, it just brings me down to earth. Jesus, you are so personal. Help me stay connected. Help me care the way you care. So I want to go into the healing in Mark 7 verse 33. So now we have the picture of him taking him aside from the crowd and he put his fingers in his ear. Now, all right, I'm going to get a little bit gross here, okay? I'm going to talk about fingers and spit and saliva. 
I asked my husband to be, use them as an example, but he said, use slides instead. So <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to, you know, I thought, I'd keep it, you know, keep it clean. I won't gross you out too much. <laughs> but anyway, so he took him aside from the crowd and he put his fingers in his ears and he spat and he touched his tongue. Then we know that he looked up to heaven and he sighed and he said, be open. Now, firstly, Jesus, what I love is he put his fingers in his mouth, uh, in his ears, sorry, not his mouth, <laughs> put his fingers into the man's ears. Now, this man wouldn't have understood what Jesus was saying. So Jesus was communicating in sign language to him. Okay, right now I'm going to pray for you and I'm going to put my finger out. And he will talk to him that way. Well, that's what I imagine him to be. So after putting his fingers in the man's ears and removing them, Jesus says, no, Mark says, then spitting on his own fingers, he touched the man's tongue. You're like, okay, Jesus, what's going on here? That's the third time. <laughs> well, actually, he does one. So the reference is in Mark 8, 23. And also you can find um, in John 9, 6, which I put it up for you, another two times that Jesus uses spit to heal someone. So Jesus uses spit in his healings on two occasions. So I'm going, okay, what is going on with a spit? Why are you using your spit to heal? Why can't you just like lay your hands and put the healing oil on and let's be done with it? <laughs> Don't worry, people. We're not going to spit on you. So <laughs> I'm like, I'm going, no one's going to come to altar calls anymore. <laughs> Like, if I do, if the Holy Spirit leads us, please trust me, I'm not going to spit on you. So, researching it, several Roman writers and Jewish rabbis consider saliva to be a treatment, a valid treatment for blindness. So, in the days of Jesus, they were actually, since the people of that day had a high view of saliva healing properties, they believe it was a cure for inflammation and other diseases. So that's why Jesus used spit to communicate his intention to heal because this man would have been, oh, I get what you're doing. That's very familiar to me because he sees that saliva is part of the healing process. And so the use of saliva meant that Jesus was going to heal him. Are you hearing are you hearing? So verse 34 says, he says, be open. So all of a sudden the man could hear, not 40%, not 60%, not 70%, but 100% he could hear. And his tongue was free so he could speak plainly. So two things happen. Mark uses, so two things happen right there. This man could hear. So can you imagine not being able to hear? Um, there's been so many videos on YouTube where you see these little babies or kids for the first time getting some in, um, implants in their ears. And honestly, it makes me smile, the joy that when I see this child hearing their parents' voice for the first time, their mother's voice for the first time, they're like, what, what's oh my God, I can hear. And the, and the mother and the dog, everyone's bawling their eyes out and they're crying because there's such joy in the place that this child can connect with his parents. The parents are like, you know, and the child's still, you know, going, what's going on? So can you imagine this man? All of a sudden he could hear a flood of sound come into his life. He could hear the crowd talking. He could actually hear his friends. He could actually hear the birds in the tree, the winds blowing in the trees. He could hear the sound of his own voice. He could hear the sound of the voice of Jesus Christ. How sweet the sounds. We sing that song, Amazing Grace. He went from complete silence to perfect surround sounds. 
to all the young ones. My son, when he was living with us, he's in his own home, thank God. He bought this boom box. Is that what you call it? Sorry if I sound 80s right now. But um, <laughs> so he bought this speaker in his car and literally it was, you get home at 11 at night, it's off half day. Do not come. And he'll come while I'm sleeping. Doom, 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 doom. It's like literally my... Our room, <laughs> and it's like, oh my god! And I'm texting him, turn it down, turn it down. <laughs> this is one of your rules. Turn it down. People are sleeping. Anyway, I don't know if my hearing's just getting a little bit older that I'm not really adapting to surround sound. But you know what? Praise God, this man was. So the Bible said he could speak plainly. So this comes from the Greek word orthos, meaning straight or right. And we get words like orthodox, which means correct belief, and orthodontic, which means straight teeth. Everyone's touching their teeth now. <laughs> so what I love about that is there is a promise to that the Lord will restore, amen, and make your path straight or set right. Who's come from a place of brokenness when the Lord has made your path straight? JL spoke about that this morning. I was, oh, I'm telling you, God is doing something. So the promise of that speech, of the speech will be restored, was used another time in the scripture found in, I'm just going to ask, where's Isaiah 35, verse 5 to 6. Love this. Love this one. Then the eyes of the blind shall be open, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. Before Jesus was born, before Jesus died on the cross, thousands of years before that, there was a promise written in Isaiah 35 that the day will come when Jesus will step in the city of Decapolis and he will meet this man who was deaf and could not speak. And the promise and the prophecy of Isaiah 35 was fulfilled on that day. That is why God said, Mark, write it down. You've got to understand the word. It is not a bunch of words that we're going to go, oh, we're going to put it on this chapter, this chapter. There is a beginning and there is an end. God speaks in the old and the new. It all points back to Jesus. All points back to Jesus. We see the promise fulfilled through our Savior in Mark 7. I put a bunch of promises that I found through the Bible of healing and promises that, that God will restore. If you can just show that, Wes, there's a bunch of scriptures there. Went through it. Moses. We all preach about Moses. He felt inadequate. He couldn't speak. I'm slow of tongue, giving God so much excuses. How many of us are giving God excuses right now? Now, nah, I'd rather stay, you know, in the desert with my sheep. I don't want to serve. I, I'm inadequate. Someone told me I was stupid. Someone told me I can't speak. But that is not true. You've got to understand that is full of promises and truth straight from God to remind you that he has got you and that he will use you because he wants to do a great work in you. Amen? You're too quiet. Come on. This is the word. Get excited. Your doctor doesn't give you a promise. When you had COVID, you didn't get a promise. But when we're feeling overwhelmed or sick or, you know, things are not going right or our family's all over the place, we can go to the Word of God and we can read how many promises that God will deliver us and set us free. Amen? Amen? He will restore. So may I encourage you this morning to hold on to your promise of your healing, to your dream, Whatever limitation has been on you, you break that in the name of Jesus. You say, devil, mm -mm, you're not going to get me. You're not going to limit me. He tried to limit me over the last few months. I'm like, oh, gosh, this is so annoying. 
And I felt limited. I felt bound. And I was like, okay, here we go. It's come up again. But you know what? I was like, okay, well, I'm going to use this time wisely. All right, God, speak to me. I sat down patiently waiting for my date that I can drive my car. But in that six weeks, I spent the time with the Lord and I went through my word and he reminded me of the promise that he has for my life and for my family and for my future. So gone was the fear, gone was anxiety, gone was the doubt, gone was the I feel sorry for myself. What it did within me is still faith, strength, capacity, boldness and confidence to say, devil, when I get out of my bed, you better watch out. So I'm, I'm no more going to deal with this nonsense any longer. So how do you respond to Jesus? My last point is the response that Jesus does everything well. In Mark 36, Jesus told the crowd not to tell anyone But the more he told them not to, the more they spread the news. And everything he does is wonderful. Amen? Who who can brag about Jesus? Everything he does is wonderful. He even makes a deaf to hear and gives speech to those who cannot speak. Again, Isaiah refers to the Messiah, the Savior, healing and setting people free. Does Jesus do everything well in your life? Yeah, Alan, yeah, Pastor Alan's like, yep. Come on, you've got to have that sass in you. Yep. No matter what my bank account says, Jesus does it well. If I ever got a job, Jesus does it well. Even if my family is not knowing Jesus, he's going to do it well. Even though my children are away from God, he is going to do it well. Come on, you've got to learn to prophesy and speak. You've got to learn to pray and to just have that you know, such a tenacity of faith just to say, no matter what my circumstances look like, Jesus does it well. Amen? Amen. Let's give him some glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So I just want to spend the next few minutes, just I want you now, just to open your hearts right now. And I want to go back to that phrase that we read, be open. Be open. How's your ears right now? What are you listening to right now? How's your speech? Do people identify you when you open your mouth as a Christian? Can they hear God in your sound? Can they hear God in the way you speak? What are you hearing? Are you hearing the enemy's voice over God's voice? Are you believing the lies more than the truth right now? We all have a past. We all come from something, but sometimes the enemy will like to lock us in the past. But you know what? That's not true. When you start to unpack the word of God and understand his truth for your life. My husband always says it to me when I'm feeling a bit, you know, wobbly, especially when I was sick. It's like, whose truth are you believing? Whose truth are you believing? I'm like, okay, okay. (laughs) All right. Get in my word. It's a good, it's a loving rebuke because you need that. You need good friends in your life. Having good friends in your life helps you stay on the path. God wants the ears of your heart this morning to be open. He wants you to hear what he is saying. He wants you to listen to his words. Don't listen to the news. Don't listen to how the world is going. Don't even read the Facebook comments to tell you, well, you've got to believe in this and believe in that and you've got to be this and you've got to be that. <sighs> this is not irrelevant. This is our map. This is our journey into being better people, to being a better Christian. This book helps us stay grounded, stay well. How many of us are not open to his truth right now? 
because of situations, because you're feeling like, oh, I you know, just can't do this anymore. How many of us are not opening our mouths at the moment because of disappointment, because we've been discouraged? How many of you used to be so zealous for Jesus and now you can't even open your mouth to tell people about Jesus? God wants your mouth to be open once again. He wants you to talk to Him again. I'm not talking about the pulpit on the stage. I'm talking about one-on-one. That you learn to open your mouth every morning. And even whatever time of the day you open your mouth and say, Good morning, Lord. Here I am. He wants our mouths to be open with praise once again and thanksgiving once again and intercede for others once again. Not to get caught up in our own lives. You know, COVID's done a bit of damage where he's tried to disconnect us from relationships, closed our mouths. But I believe today the Lord wants to open everyone's mouth here today to activate something in you right now. God wants your life to be open. We love testimonies, amen. We get to hear amazing testimonies most Sundays because these people's lives are open to Jesus to give Him the glory. Let your life be open. We hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast from Grace Life Church. For more information about us or any of our services, please visit our website at gracelife.com.au.